Welcome back for the last session of today. Uh, my name is Stefan Vogel. Um, I'm a PhD student here for Professor Monti at the Institute for Information <laughs> Complex Power Systems. Um, um, yeah, I, I studied electrical engineering, but with a focus on computer engineering. Um, so I mainly do here at ACS uh, software development, uh, maintenance of our real-time simulators, developing our own real-time simulators, and so on. So I'm mostly in a supporting role uh, for my for my colleagues here. Um, uh, that also applies for the reserve, where we have a work package four. Uh, in which we basically do a lot of real-time simulations to validate and test the new control schemes which have been uh, developed in the work package 2 and 3, so that's the voltage control and the frequency control. In the presentation today, I'm going to cover um, the basics of real-time simulation. Um, and before I start, I am may be asked, would, would like to ask you, who of you already has done a real-time simulation um, maybe as part of, of their studies. Okay. Good. I, um, I think for the, maybe the first 10 or 20 minutes, I pro probably will recover the basics, so that's uh, nothing new for you. Um, but later on, I will uh, cover some examples uh, how we use real time simulation here at ACS and also in reserve. So I will cover why do we do real-time simulation, when does it make sense to, re to do real-time simulation, and when not. I think that's a very uh, important um, distinction which everybody should keep in mind uh, if, if you consider doing it. Um, then I will cover some of the simulation tools, uh, the commercial ones which, are, which exist, the main three vendors uh, I, will, I will cover. Uh, and then I will uh, talk a little bit about our own simulation tool, which we developed uh, especially for Reserve. So that's a, a software tool which we released as open source software, and it has been started. Uh, yeah, we, we started to develop it um, just for Reserve, but now we are planning to continue to that development. And then I will go on to the uh, Reserve examples and some other um, examples we did in, in at ACS here. But before I actually start to cover the, the real-time simulation part, I want to go back and, and start with the definition of, of real-time because I, I think most people, uh, or often it gets, uh, uh, there's a, a wrong understanding of what real-time actually is. So um, real-time is a term we use in, in many areas, so not just in, in power system simulation, we use it in financial markets, we use it for, uh, different terms in, in ICT and computing. So we have, for example, a real-time clock. We talk about real-time protocols and so on. But all of them, they basically, they have one thing in common, and that's the definition. A system is said to be real-time if the total correctness of an operation depends not only on the logical correctness, so in our case, the simulation result, but also on, uh, upon the time in which it's performed. Um, and then, there are like um, there's a classification which is quite common where we classify real-time systems in uh, hard real-time, firm real-time, and soft real-time system. The hard real-time system would be defined so that uh, missing a deadline during the operation of that system causes a total system failure, which could result into death or harm of, of people, or to, to um, for example, in our case, invalid simulation results, or even worse, we could, for example, completely destroy some hardware or some devices which are involved in the simulation. Then there's a definition of firm real-time system where infrequent deadline misses are tolerable but degrade the system's quality of service, um, um, but the, still, the system still could uh, go on to function and would just result in a, deg a degradation. And uh, a soft real-time system is defined as the usefulness of a result degrades after its deadline uh, and thereby degrading the system's quality of service. Um, so, by that definition, we can basically can say that real-time systems are not hard, not what we say in the, in the, by the definition. Um, they are also not more accurate as um, a non-real-time system. Um, so I thought maybe we should come up with a few examples of real-time systems to get a better understanding. Um, Somebody of you maybe has an example for a real-time system? 
which is maybe more a bit outside of the common understanding. Yeah? Maybe it's a bit uh, long to explain the example, but um, we have a distribution network where we work, an MPD, and uh, sometimes we have a limited number of nodes over this uh, network. So we use the simulation to uh, extend the size of the network by, by having a distribution network of more nodes, maybe node 34, which is from IEEE, and we integrate to actual network, which is a distribution network, and then yeah. we do the experiment as a power card domain in the loop. With, uh, yeah. I think that's already a, con a very specific example for power system simulations. I thought about for also, for example, um, an aviation system, an aircraft has, uh, is a real, has real time systems in their controls. That I would, for example, classify as a typical hard real time system because if that controller fails, yeah, we would maybe have an, an airplane crash as just happened a few weeks ago again. Um, so that's definitely a hard real time system. But for example, we could also have a video game or let's say a video player. Video player in itself, we could also define as a, a real-time system because we want to have to show basically each frame of the video image or each frame of the of the game experience um, at a periodical periodical interval. And if for some reason my system who on which I run this uh, this game gets interrupted because it thinks we need to do Windows update or something else. Um, then we basically have uh, some degradation in the in the system's performance. Maybe the video is lagging a little bit, um, um, but that's also still a real-time system. Or maybe a, an example from a totally different area. If if I think about myself, I know I currently have to write a paper, and there's a deadline uh, next week or even in a month. Um, so I'm also in myself a deadline. I know a, a, a real-time system. I know I have a deadline. So the deadlines can even be quite long stretch. So we are not talking about, about a specific time frame, not seconds, milliseconds, microseconds or so on. The real-time system by itself, the definition could also um, yeah, have much larger uh, time spans until we have the deadline. Okay, so um, then the, the next question is why do we want to do real-time simulation? What kind of advantages are we hoping to gain? By doing that, um, and the, the reason is mainly because we want to reduce risk in during the product development or, or deployment, um, and uh, that's why you basically combine real-time simulation with existing uh, methods of, of product development. Um, most of the time, we cannot test the real device in, in the, the like in the, in real grid. But if we think about for for example, a PV inverter, it would be quite hard to test this in a real grid um, and because we, for example, would not see all the different uh, corner cases or, or fault scenarios in a real grid. Um, so if we, if we think about the, like the traditional model-based design workflow, this week cycle here, we usually start with a requirements definition and architecture and then we basically start by doing maybe offline simulations. So everything just maybe on Simulink on, on a workstation. Um, and before we basically had real-time simulation as a tool, we would probably have been stopped somewhere around here with our simulations. We would have finished the design of the system and we then would start the implementation of a prototype uh, and we would hope that everything goes along. Um, and here basically real-time simulation can step in and basically have so that we can have a transition from offline simulation and then actually um, test the system with a real prototype together. That means um, real-time simulation refers to a computer model of a physical system that can execute at the same rate as actual wall clock time because we still have like a physical prototype, some device which is connected to our real-time simulation. And I think that's the, the key point here. Real-time simulation only makes sense as long as we do hardware in the loop. Because if we don't connect any real devices in our, um, or any real signals to our, our simulator, we could do the same thing, the same simulation also in offline. And um, we would maybe be even faster or slower, it doesn't matter. But real-time simulation it's in itself is only really useful if we do hardware in the loop. By hardware in the loop, I mean that we basically um, 
decouple our system in two parts. One is a, we call a rest of system. In a power system, that's usually then the power system, maybe a microgrid. Uh, then we have some kind of interface in the middle, and on the right side we have hardware under test, which is usually the product we, we are developing, for example, a TV inverter. Um, to come back to the different kinds of simulation we have, I, I have like these uh, the timelines of, of three different types of simulation. Um, the traditional case here is the, the offline simulation, so non-real-time simulation, um, where we basically have uh, periodic computations in each time step here. We see that uh, denoted with uh, FTN uh, and TN plus one and so on. And we just basically start the computation of each time step as soon as the computation of the previous time step has been finished. That could be, uh, result in a case where the simulation is actually faster than uh, what we, the, the execution of the simulation is faster than the um, time frame which we simulate. We see that here. So the execution of a time step t to tn um, only takes maybe half the, the real time. So we basically get an acceleration. But we could also have it in the same, uh, in the other way around, where the computation may, might take longer than the uh, actual wall clock time. I can give two examples here. The first part we usually see in, um, in systems where we have quite large time steps. So if we maybe want to do a study where we simulate a power system over weeks, days, or even years, then the time steps are very large usually, maybe um, minutes, days, or, so, or even larger. And um, the calculation would usually be faster. So we get an acceleration because we cannot wait for a simulation of one month to actually take one month. Um, and the other example, uh, we see usually if we want to simulate um, systems where we need to use really small time steps, such like, for example, uh, yeah, power electronics where we have inverters, which we really, really need to simulate with time steps in the microsecond range, and then the computation takes longer and we actually need to wait longer. And the real-time simulation part is the last, the last part about which we are talking today here. Here, we basically introduce an artificially uh, idle or, or wait time so that we basically start the computation of each time step when the time has come according to our wall clock. What do we need for, like, what are the typical components for doing a real time simulation? Um, looks a little bit different from the typical offline simulation where you just use your, your workstation. The, the real time simulation extends this in a way that we still have our workstation. The workstation is there to run our modeling environment. That could be Xeolink or, um, or Plex or something else. Um, and also a runtime simulation, which we then use to basically start the simulation uh, and monitor the simulation, which is then uh, executed on a, on a real-time target. Um, that means the actual simulation is not executed on the workstation anymore, but on this uh, specialized hardware. Um, I think uh, most of you have been yesterday in our lab and there you, you've seen the, the uh, simulators. They are quite big, they are special hardware, they are like optimized for this real-time execution to basically guarantee that this calculation never exceeds this, this deadline here. Um, as I said, real-time simulation only makes sense when we can connect real hardware and do a hardware in the loop uh, test. And for that purpose, we need an I.O. interface to actually connect our, um, our um, hardware. Because if you think about uh, an offline simulation on our workstation, my laptop, I might maybe have an audio jack but that's it. Uh, so we, we use some specialized um, cards in these simulators. These are most of, most of the time they are based on, on FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, uh, about which I will talk a, later a little bit more. And they allow us to have an interface to, a, to the real world, but still on a signal level. So with signal level, we are talking about analog or digital signals with a range of maybe plus minus 10 volts. So that's still not a, an I.O. interface which we can use to connect, for example, a PV, and P, PV inverter in case we do the so-called power hardware in the loop where we actually operate at power levels. Um, yeah. There's another, uh, there are different types of hardware in the loop simulation. Um, uh, the ones where we need the power amplifier for, that's called power hardware in the loop. There's um, 
there's also the uh, controller hardware in, in the loop where we basically try to strip everything away which operates at power level and we maybe just interface the controller of a, of a PV inverter with our simulator and then we, we keep the, the switching, the simulation of the switching devices inside the inverter to the real-time simulator. So uh, most of the time that's actually a lot easier to handle because it's much less dangerous. If something bad happens, we, we cannot Usually we cannot even break our I.O. card, uh, we just would get wrong results, maybe, uh, but that's it. Um, doing power hardware in the loop is a lot harder, actually, uh, because we, we always run in the, in the, um, the danger of having an instable system, because these components here, the power amplifier, uh, the hardware on the test, um, could become instable because all of this I.O. conversion, the amplification, has an, uh, um, an effect on the simulation, there's some delay, maybe a measurement error, and uh, that can result in an instable system. So every time we want to do a power hardware in the loop simulation, we actually need for each case to do um, an analytical um, analysis of, of the system, of the simulator, of the amplifier, of the device under test, as well as uh, of the, the grid side which we have in our simulator to ensure that the whole system remains stable and we don't destroy our amplifiers or devices. And then there's also um, a hardware in the loop uh, type which we call software in the loop and that's usually if we also can omit the signal levels and we just purely communicate between the simulator and um, some software. It could be a, a cloud application, some, some type of um, uh, flexibility trading platform or uh, a control center. So if you just are interested in testing maybe the IEC 6150 protocol together with our application, we can rely on that and then we just basically connect our software or tools via a network connection to the real-time simulator and we don't need um, these I.O. cards. Okay. Um, yeah. If, if, Something is unclear, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, the next part here, what I said before, basically applies to, um, to other in industries as well. Real time simulation itself is not only used in, in power systems. Uh, in fact, I think the first users have been uh, automotive av aviation. Uh, and many of the, the, the vendors all, not only have uh, clients from a power system, uh, power system engineers as clients, but also. Um, yeah, the, the automotive industry. Um, so all, everything I said before applies to, to all of these industries, I would say. Um, and now I want to focus a bit more on the power system um, industry. Um, and I will start with a, like a brief history of, of, of simulation or testing. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's still a relative new um, tool, I would say. So um, it's maybe started like or really has become popular and, and usable in the last 20 years. But before that, we basically, um, people built just like small downscale version of, of a real power system uh, and had analog circuits basically not really simulate, but just to test how, how a large scale power system would behave. Um, then later on, these analog uh, simulators have been extended um, uh, by partially digital control system, so then you could still have your power system in a downscaled analog version, but you could use um, maybe a digital control system together with that. These are the, the hybrid simulators. And then later on, around the, the 90s, we've seen the, the first um, custom digital simulators um, start, which have been developed in academia first, and then uh, they have been later on commercialized um, as digital commercial off-the-shelf simulators um, beginning uh, between 1990s and 2000. And a quite recent development we've seen is that um, due to the increased uh, penetration of, of uh, power electronics in the, in the grid that we uh, need simulation time steps which are smaller than what we can handle on these uh, software-based systems. So we basically started to add field programmable gate arrays to the simulators to um, allow us to reduce the time steps uh, to even microseconds, which then allows us to still simulate these uh, power electronic devices. So what we see today, if we would buy a real-time simulator, is usually one of the digital 
uh, commercial off the shelf simulators. That's a nice package, something you can put on your desk or uh, do, uh, um, put in the lab. And these internally consist of a, of a, um, a CPU, so that's uh, basically a normal computing system um, with these specialized I.O. cards as well as FPGAs. And in most cases, the FPGA handles uh, I.O., but also simulation. So we, we basically see a separation where we might run part of a, of a simulation on a, on a CPU, a software programmable device, and other parts uh, on, on an FPGA. And basically, the like these four different uh, four last uh, types of simulation we usually call digital real time simulators (DRTS). Um, not to be confused with RTDS, which is a real time digital simulator, which is actually a company which sells them. So it's like a, just a, a small difference here. And um, maybe you've seen that on the first slide here. That's a picture uh, of Hydro Quebec in uh, Canada, where they had for long, uh, a long time they had a, an analog simulator, and that's how it looked like. So it was like uh, a lot of racks with like the analog devices or like an analog downscale version, for example, of a transmission line or a little transformer, and then they use a lot of cables to basically modular interconnect these different components, like a transmission line with a with a transformer and thereby they could build a system which has a huge, o huge overhead because every time you want to load a new model, you would basically stand there for a few days and reconnect or model the, the new system. Interestingly, the, all the, like, most of this development here, the, the commercialization of real-time simulators took place in, in Canada. I, I don't know why. Um, but um, we see both, both OpenRT, which is one of the major uh, vendors for real-time simulators, as well as RTDS, both are from, from, uh, from Canada. Okay. Um, on, on this uh, slide here, we see a selection of, of simulation use cases, so uh, applications or use cases where we would usually want to uh, use simulation. For, for studying them, and we see that they uh, span over a quite large area of different um, uh, transients or dynamics we want to study. So in a multi-area power system, spanning <coughs> over a nation or a continent, we all might only be interested in, in a slow dynamics, and that reaches to, to ultra-fast dynamics where we <coughs> then look into like the power electronic device uh, with IGBTs and so on. And, um, Depending on that use case, we are usually interested in a different bandwidth of the signal which we want to analyze, and that dictates in a way also the, the simulation time steps which we have to use, ranging from yeah, sometimes seconds if we are just doing like a um, um, transient stability analysis um, or, or low flow uh, calculations up to, to microseconds where we then do electromagnetic transient simulations. I summarized the like in my opinion, three major parts of, of uh, or types of simulation in, in that table. So we have a load flow, which is basically just a static simulation, one at, at one point in time. You get a single sol solution, so static phaser in that case, um, and we only get a result for the nominal frequency. And we have a transient stability analysis, where we um, get dynamic phasers, which we can update, and we can see uh, the first time we can see a transients in a system caused by by uh, load changes or fault, and then the most detailed version of, uh, of, a si of a simulation we do in power system is the electromagnetic transient simulation, where we calculate, where we basically use instantaneous values of voltage and current, um, and um, have then like simulation time steps between microseconds and typically up to 50 microseconds, what's uh, what we use. And, so, yeah. Yeah, in terms of computational like power and requirements, which is the most like like most uh, which one of these three are the highest requirement? Or it does it depend yeah. on the time step? Yeah, it depends on whether you account the time step. If you say 
the electromagnetic transient in simulation, because of the small time step, you have to do like a lot of times, like a lot of steps to basically cover some some time. So that's quite computational and uh, expensive. But if if you compare the um, the amount of computation you need per time step. Um, on the total number of yeah. computations. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to say. I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay, okay. okay. It's the yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, especially if you, you can see here, if we go into the, if we do our real time simulation with electromagnetic transients, it becomes harder because we have the smaller time steps, so the deadlines get smaller, the, the types of systems we, we need, um, it's much harder. So if you think about, if we think about like a day ahead of forecast or planning, we could still uh, describe this as a simulation or as a real-time system because we need to finish the day ahead planning before the next day. So we have a, a deadline or a time step of one day. Maybe, and um, we could still do that on a normal like PC on workstation maybe. But for the electromagnetic transients, magnetic transients because of the small time step, that's not possible anymore. So we cannot use the normal Windows machine simulating. It's not possible. Yeah, in the remaining of this uh, main remaining part of the uh, presentation, I will focus uh, on real-time simulation using electromagnetic transients because that's if we want to attach hardware, if we want to attach a power amplifier, that's the only way how we can do it. Yeah, there are a, a few requirements. Um, if you think about what kind of solvers, how do we solve the electrical system? Um, in a real-time simulation, we do that in discrete time. So we, as I said, we have these time steps, and these time steps have a fixed duration, so they don't change. We don't want to have this um, because we need to periodically make the measurements of the of the real signals, and we need to update the outputs. <coughs> And the execution time of each time step must be deterministic because if it's not, um, we basically don't have to guarantee that we miss the deadline. Uh, and that kind of also dictates then the kind of solver that we can use. So we cannot really use iterative solvers because if we have an iteration and per time steps, the solver does uh, iterations until it's reached a termination condition, um, we basically can never guarantee that this termination uh, condition is is reached. Um, so in, in practice, we basically see um, very simple um, solvers in, in real-time simulators. Most of the time, that's a modified nodal analysis, where we basically just um, create an admitted matrix of the system. And then um, the actual solving of the system uh, breaks down to, um, yeah, to, to a matrix multiplication, so we don't have uh, a lot of complex solvers here. That's the most commonly used part. So then I have a few words about um, hardware in the loop. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, three different types of, of hardware in the loop. Um, and yeah, I think most of that are already covered. Mm. Our hardware in the loop is the most complicated one, but there are also different uh, ways. So we, we can use, uh, if we think about hardware in the loop, we could have, um, we could both simulate the, the device in the, sim uh, in, the, um, in the simulator, because maybe we don't have a, a full version of the device, maybe we, we're still missing the controller, so we could use the real-time simulator for uh, basically using um, for, for emulating this, this controller or the rapid control prototyping, um, or maybe the, the switching devices are not fully, uh, the, the switching hardware is not fully developed, um, and then we could implement that, or we could run like the rest of system in a simulator. So there are like two parts, uh, two, two ways how we can do it. Um, in a power hardware in the loop scenario, um, we would, on the left side, we would have our, our real-time simulator, which sets the voltage reference to the hardware in the loop amplifier, that's uh, the party in the middle. 
um, which then usually has its own controller implemented in an FPGA and controls either yeah, like a switched uh, um, amplifier or a linear amplifier, which is then connected to the hardware on the test part on the right side. And at the same time, um, because it's in the loop, you basically uh, have to measure voltage and current on the, uh, on the interface between the amplifier and the device, and you have to record the spec in order to close the loop. And all of that, what's happening here, basically, the, um, the FPGA, the sensors, they introduce, um, they introduce a delay into the, the system and an error, basically, maybe, uh, which can cause the instabilities. Um, and I made a very simple example here. Um, if we just have like a, a super simple example, a voltage source and two resistors, and we want to decouple the system and basically have a real load here on the right side and then simulate the rest of the system in a real-time simulator, we can um, describe the system with the following transfer function. And we see that the stability of that system not only depends on the, the transfer function of the amplifier, but also on the transfer function of the uh, hardware under test and rest of system, which makes which is the main reason uh, why you basically need to repeat the stability analysis for each simulation case. So not it's not okay uh, or not if we once once analyze our hardware in the loop setup, uh, the, the amplifier and the simulator. No, we need to do it basically for each um, for each model uh, which we simulate in each device. Okay. Now I um, want to, to present a few of the commercial solutions. You think you have seen them uh, already yesterday in the lab. I will start with RTDS. Um, I think this RTDS is one of the first uh, companies who, who started to sell real-time simulators. They're also, uh, unfortunately, still one of the most expensive ones um, because they are so specialized and still it's not that widespread. These devices are really expensive, so we are talking um, yeah, about millions of, of euros just to buy these racks. Um, um, but they are still state of the art. In my opinion, my personal opinion for RTDS is that they are still a little, little, little bit um, out, not outdated, but the, the whole usability of the tool is still a bit hard. So we are, we are, we are dealing with like really old um, user interfaces. It's a very closed system, it's hard to integrate with. Um, but still, it's, for, for many people, it's considered a state-of-the-art simulator today. These um, simulators consist of these racks, and each rack can have multiple processing cards. You see, see that here on, 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 that arc, uh, on that overview. Uh, and these processing cards um, basically show us the, the inherent nature of a real-time simulator, that it's, um, and that is that it's, they are parallel. They are parallel computing devices. We have multiple of these uh, processing cards in a, in a, in a real-time simulator um, in order to achieve the real-time, um, yeah, the real-time, uh, the real-time uh, criteria in order to finish our computation. If you do everything on a single processing card, we could in theory do that, but the processing time would be too. Uh, uh, sequential processing time would be too long in order to reach the, the deadlines we need. So what we usually see, we have like a, a rack here, uh, a lot of these processing cards, and then also auxiliary cards like GTIO interface cards, an FPGA card for simulation maybe. We should, sometimes we have a GTSYM card, which allows us to synchronize the simulation to a GPS time, for example. Um, and other like switches which allow us to do like simulations combining multiple racks. That's a, a figure which is a bit more complicated. I, I want to uh, basically cover like the, the basic operation of, of real-time simulator, what, it's, what we are doing in each simulation time step. Um, what we see here is basically um, one simulation time step, which is repeated over and over again in, in the simulation. And on the in these columns, we see the different processing cards and what they are actually doing. Um, each simulation time step has the same, um, yeah, uses the same procedure, um, which usually starts with a, a phase where we need to acquire the inputs, and we need to make sure that this sim sampling is always at the same time. That's why we're doing it in the 
beginning of each time step. And then, basically, during the compilation and while we are starting the real-time simulation, the simulation tools have to uh, partition the system and they have to um, identify like small building blocks which can be computed independently. Uh, on the left side, we have here, we have like denoted with P, <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, um, like small functions which we need to calculate in each time step in order to calculate the, the current injections for the system. So in what we basically do, because that's that's uh, the way RTDS is working, and RTDS is using the modified nodal analysis, we need to have um, current injections which are then later on used to solve the network. And before we can solve the network, each of the power, uh, power um, components in a simulation needs to, to calculate the injection. Then the injection is uh, communicated to a single processor here, that's the network solution processor, where we actually solve the, um, the, um, the system with, with the help of the equipment matrix. Um, and once that's done, we basically get as a result the voltages for all nodes in the system, and these um, are communicated back to the uh, components where they are of interest. Um, so we, we still see that we, we can separate the components here uh, over multiple processors, but they're still an inherently sequential part, and that's the, uh, where we need to solve the, uh, the network solution. In order to avoid that during this phase where we solve the network equation, all the other systems are idling, um, the simulators are implemented in a way that each component, so that could be, for example, a transformer, a synchronous machine, uh, a battery, um, it's usually the calculation for, uh, for these components is separated in multiple phases. So we have this phase here in, on the top where we only try to calculate the injection current and we try to keep this part as, as short as possible. Um, and then everything else, like um, solving the mechanical part of a synchronous machine could be uh, done later on in parallel while the other processor here is solving the network equation. And then we also have on the right side, at least for RTDS, they are doing it in this way, we have separate processors in, in the simulator which only handle uh, a control system. So if we, um, like everything where we don't directly connect uh, or directly influence a, a current source, um, we can handle as, as a control component, um, and they are, are solved also in parallel. And the most tricky part is, um, is basically this scheduling, how the simulators are able to partition the system and to identify which sys parts could be uh, solved in parallel, and then basically to find a schedule which is optimal in order to reduce the, the total uh, simulation time because if we we could shrink this if, if there's a way how we could uh, make the whole simulation um, time step shorter we could get um, a, a more accurate result because of the reduced simulation time step or vice versa we could um, solve more components more complex systems that's one part um, there are also other solutions um, because the solving the network solution is a, is a problem uh, which, um, which uh, the, the computation time of that network sol uh, solution rises uh, quadratically uh, uh, with the number of nodes we have in the system. So if we think about a, a system which has a hundreds or thousands of nodes, uh, the computation of that network solution would take too long. So there's uh, one workaround um, where basically the simulation tools or the user, depends on the vendor, has, uh, can try to partition the whole network topology in multiple uh, subsystems. And then these subsystems are only cu uh, coupled with uh, transmission lines. And we, if the transmission line is long enough, the simulation tool um, can use uh, the, the propagation of, of, of changes over that transmission line to actually decouple the a system, and then we would, would basically have such um, a network solution, not only once, but we would have multiple ones, and we could even more um, parallelize the simulation, and that's critical. And in, in my opinion, that's also the major point where these uh, companies or vendors um, mm -hmm. differentiate in to which extent they can do this automatically for you, so you just compile and run simulations, 
or whether you have to do that yourself and you have to identify like where can I cut my, my uh, network topology, where is a transmission line which is long enough to do this decoupling. Okay, coming to the next vendor, which is OpenRT. Um, it's a, a newer company. They also, I think, they exist for around 20 years now. Um, and they have a kind of different approach. So OpenRT not only covers power system, um, power system industry, but also automotive and aviation. RTDS only um, covers uh, power system engineers. Um, and they um, they started by using commercial off-the-shelf systems. So they started with like a PC um, running a, a standard operate, uh, standard Linux operating system, and then they are, they tried to optimize that system for the for the real-time execution. Added the I/O ports you can see here in the front, and so on. The, the advantage of that approach is that it's because it's a much more open system. They are using, for example, Zmodink for the modeling. Um, it's easier to extend if they have like a very a special application, a special I/O protocol or interface you need. It's usually easier to implement this uh, on an OpenRT system. Downside is that the complexity um, increases. So you are starting to integrate like a lot of different uh, software solutions which are not just developed by OpenRT. There's like Simulink, you have the Linux operating system. Um, MATLAB and, and everything has to fit somehow together and in my experience that usually results in like quite hard to debug um, uh, error messages and problems whereas with RTDS from the beginning on that's a, a fully custom designed system they have like their own operating system they even have their own compiler to generate these um, the code which is in the end executed which is yeah, kind of more an in-house solution the, the whole system um, but on the, on the downside, it makes integration or extension uh, much harder. Okay. Uh, coming to the last uh, company I, I want to cover here, that's Typhoon. It's a quite early, a quite new company. I think they started uh, five, five, seven years ago, um, and they um, they have a fundamentally different approach and. Their tools are only based on FPGAs. So they, they use only the field programmable gate arrays inside, which allows them to reduce the uh, simulation time step. So here we are talking about um, simulation time steps in the yeah, nanosecond to microsecond range. Uh, so that's also the reason why these tools are most commonly used for, for testing uh, uh, electrical fries, for example, or um, inverters. Or smaller microgrids. Yeah, um, I mentioned it earlier. Using the FPGAs in order to reduce simulation time steps is a trend we can see uh, for all for all vendors. OpenRT and RTDS nowadays also have FPGAs as as um, extensions for the simulators. Um, but again, it's kind of an integration issue or usability issue. Adding the FPGA later, then integrating it with like a, a model which is running on a CPU is much harder because you you start like dealing with different time steps. The simulation has a small, uh, the FPGA has a small time step, then you have like the rest of the system which has a la larger time step. You have a um, multi-rate system which becomes complicated. Typhoon is in that regard easier because they say everything we do is only on the FPGA, um, and it's a yeah for nicely integrated system. Downside here is then because of the FPGA, the, um, the, the capacity of the number of nodes is limited. So we cannot uh, simulate large uh, transmission networks on an untaken simulator, for example. Okay, but yeah, um, I think uh, in the last 10 years, uh, real-time simulation has become much more popular in academia and also in, in development. Um, I know, for example, uh, Siemens is actively using uh, real-time simulators for testing their HVDC um, um, products, so for testing large multi-level modular converters. They um, they have they they use uh, real-time simulation a lot, um, and 
we see that more and more companies are, are entering the market. Um, there's Plex, for example, which, which has their own like small real-time simulator simulation target. Now, MathWorks with Stimulink also started to to partner up with Speedgoat to develop um, their own um, hardware targets on which you then can run Stimulink. Um, and in the end, I think it's it's quite nice to see that we have more and more companies, and the the prices for the real-time simulators are starting to fall. So. We're not talking about like millions anymore. Nowadays, I think small real-time simulator starts around like uh, 100, 200,000 euros. Still large, but um, that's why basically we also try to, to at ACS, we start uh, to, to develop our own systems, um, just um, yeah, to understand them better to um, and have more flexibility um, for, for adding new models, new components, and uh, yeah. One of uh, one example for such a custom system is a, a DSP cluster. That's a, a rack we have downstairs, and um, it consists of, of many uh, DSPs. The DSP is a digital signal processor, which um, can be used, for example, to, to parallelize a, a lot of similar uh, calculations quite well. So the, the design objective for this uh, simulator was um, to be able to si simulate a large wind farms where we have many uh, instances of the same model, like a, a wind turbine or a PV cells, um, which are similar. And then such a device would be uh, it's quite nice to, to, to scale up the real-time simulation to lots, uh, like hundreds or thousands of um, of wind, uh, wind turbines or, or like uh, TV inverters. But alone, uh, that device alone is not a full real-time simulator, so we don't have like a, an FPGA which would solve a, a network solution of the grid, uh, but that device would then be coupled to something like RTS, so it's more like an extension um, for a specific purpose, like a special purpose uh, simulator for, for one type of components. Then for reserve, I mentioned earlier, we started to develop DPSIM. DPSIM is a C, C++ application um, where we basically started to implement um, models for, for uh, EMT and dynamic phaser uh, simulation. Um, and we added a Python interface, which allows us, uh, gives us an easy way to to uh, interact with that simulation, we can load models and we can script the whole simulation uh, and we can use it because it's implemented. The, 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 the simulation kernel, which actually does the execution of the time step, is implemented in C and C++, we can use it for real-time simulation. So we have, we have been able to, to run simulations with uh, 50 microsecond time steps um, here as well. And um, I think the biggest point is it's, it's an open source software. Um, so everybody can look into the definition and the, the implementation of the models, which is not possible with RTDS or OpenRT. So actually confirming that the models which are implement, implemented by RTDS and OpenRT are, are correct, it's a bit hard or comparing them. If you want to transition from an RTDS to an OpenRT simulator, you always have a problem. So with, uh, with DPSIM, we, we tried to get rid of these problems, it's open source, you can look into the implementation of the models. And we, we use something called the Common Information Model, SIM, uh, for describing the network topology and the uh, parameters. Um, SIM is a, um, an open standard, it's nowadays used by mostly by transmission network operators to exchange network information about their, about their grids. Um, and that's another disadvantage of the currently existing commercial solutions where their modeling formats for exchanging the, the grids are either um, like Simulink or something completely <coughs> proprietary and switching between uh, different tools is, is often hard and you would end up um, remodeling the whole system just with another software tool. And we hope that in the future we can get rid of that by using a common standard and then importing into these tools uh, the, the SIM format. Um, 
yeah, the DPSIM software also runs on Linux, so we kind of copied the approach which OpenRT was using. Um, it's a quite open system, it's cheap, we can use existing um, hardware for that, um, but we need to tune it a little bit, and for that we are using a special version of Linux called the preempt RT patch set, which tries to optimize Linux for, for real-time applications, and yeah, the, the, the main developer of Linux, uh, Linux, Linux Torvalds said, yeah, controlling a laser with Linux is crazy. So it's, it's still hard to optimize that system for, for real-time execution. OpenRT has done it, so I think um, that's a good example. Um, but there are like different opinions on whether you should like something like Linux or more a custom solution like RTDS is doing it. Okay, that brings me to the last part of my presentation, uh, where I want to cover some of the examples how we use these tools in Reserve and so on. You. Um, in in Reserve, we um, are dealing with a. Uh, Romanian uh, transmission network for uh, frequency studies to, to um, test how the, the frequency controls, which is, are developed in Work Package 2, um, perform. And, and here we are dealing with the problem that the Romanian transmission system in the original version, which we got as a model, has over 1,500 network nodes, and that's too much to simulate it on, on, on any uh, real-time simulator with the electromagnetic transient uh, solver. Um, as an example here, we see these processing cards of RTDS, and even if we would combine the co total computing capacity of our instance here, we would not be capable of, of simulating um, the, the complete Romanian transmission network. In this full detail, we would need to make uh, simplifications, which we would try to avoid. Um, and uh, one approach uh, which we came up with uh, here is that we can try to do um, co-simulation. So we are trying to couple multiple real-time simulation systems together, um, basically leveraging the existing uh, simulation capacity from different uh, universities or different countries. So in, in Reserve, we are partnering with uh, Politecnico di Torino, and, and they have an OpenRT uh, real-time simulator, and we basically then can partition the system um, not only within a simulator, but also between multiple simulators. And that only gives us also the, the advantage that uh, we don't have to care or like <coughs> care about uh, data confidentiality issues, especially if we envision to, to run such a system for the simulation of the whole European grid, uh, it would be quite hard to basically get a monolithic model combining all the transmission networks from all network operators in, in Europe. It's hard to get a, a detailed model. So what we proposed here was that we basically each, each country should handle the simulation of their grid and then the, um, these real-time simulators are coupled into a pan-European uh, simulation infrastructure. And, and thereby we would solve the, uh, the capacity issue that we don't have a, sim a single simulator which could simulate uh, the whole grid. And we, we, we solve the data confidentiality issues because the, these simulators in the different countries would only exchange uh, interface signals, so just the simulated results, but not the whole uh, topology information and parameters of the network. But of course, yeah, if we think about how we could, we could, could, how could we could couple such simulators which are located in completely geographically different uh, locations, um, we have to deal with uh, like communication latency. So if you just send like these interface signals, let's say I have a transmission line between uh, Romania and, and Germany or somewhere else here to, to, do, uh, to Italy, um, the propagation of these signals until once I send them from the simulator in Polito to Aachen takes a, a couple of milliseconds. So um, we have here a, a propagation delay uh, over the internet because that's how we couple the simulators, which is much larger than the physical propagation on the transmission line, maybe of a, of a, of a voltage dip. Um, so we have to come up with a solution how we can compensate these communication delays in order to build such a European uh, network of, of simulators for simulating the, the, the grid. 
And for that, um, a colleague of me, Markus Smirz, uh, started to develop um, this DP Sim uh, simulation platform, which is a combination. It's basically, I mentioned it earlier, it's can solve the ne uh, network in electromagnetic transients, so we get instantaneous voltage and current results. But also, we have uh, using the same simulator to use uh, to, to do the uh, simulation with dynamic phasers, um, which is um, yeah um, simulation um, domain which which Marcus uh, decided to use because it gives us a kind of averaging um, and it's much more robust once we couple uh, the, the simulators over a larger distance. Um, then a completely different example um, how we uh, how we could use the pan-European simulation infrastructure and here we actually want to do hardware in the loop and that's um, by combining the mobile network uh, infrastructure which, which you have just seen in, in our lab downstairs uh, for example with uh, field devices we have uh, in, in Ireland so in, in reserve we have field trials which are conducted in uh, several different places in Ireland um, but we have like the mobile communication um, networks um, in here in Germany in our lab and we are using the same pan-european network uh, for basically doing hardware in the loop simulations between the grid the mobile base station and the, the real um, field devices in, in Ireland um, another example is the uh, is something we call RT Super Lab. That was an, an effort which we started uh, in, in 2017. And, and here we, we partnered up with uh, several universities in the US. Um, so at uh, Sandia National Lab um, and uh, Idaho National Labs and some, some universities, as well as us here in Germany and Politecnico di Turin in Italy. And, um, in, in that demonstration, we basically interconnected the first time 10 real-time simulators in one big simulation um, consisting of two transmission networks, one in Germany in, in Aachen and the other one in Idaho, and then multiple um, distribution systems connecting here. And we could basically demonstrate that um, having real hardware devices such as controllers or um, a PV um, plant or I think somewhere we had even uh, like a, a physical a wind turbine. We could we could show that um, certain changes propagate between these different coupled simulation subsystems, um, and thereby study the interaction between them. Now that's just another map about the different simulation sites, and. We had in, in that super lab example here, we cheated a little bit. We, we used the HVDC line between uh, Germany and the US because with an AC system, it was too hard to, to compensate the communication delay we have across the ocean. So that here we have a communication delay of uh, 100, 200 uh, milliseconds. And for an AC system, it, the changes, the kind of changes, uh, transients we could, we could see here uh, with an AC system were not interesting enough and, and caused uh, too much uh, system instability. So we used an, an HVDC link here. Okay, that brings me to the last part of my uh, presentation. Um, I think many of you, have, that's just a repetition of what we've seen yesterday. Um, the different parts of, of our lab what kind of real-time simulation tools we have. We have the RTDS, we have the PC clusters on which we run our own simulators. We have the OPRT, ESP, the spe specialized hardware, and we have FLAPS, which is um, one of the, the custom developed um, power amplifier we use for hardware in the loop, power hardware in the loop. And yeah, you've seen that yesterday already. And then, we're combining these uh, tools with external testing facilities, as I showed you before, to connect with the um, with a mobile network base station, which maybe is located at Ericsson, or a, a vehicle to grid charging station, which is located in one of the t uh, trial sites at in Ireland. Yeah, that's uh, so nothing new. Let's skip over that. Um, 
that was a quite early um, example, far be, uh, before my time here at ACS, where we uh, did um, hardware in the loop simulations with our real time simulator RTDS and the um, Institute for Building Climate, EBC, and, and we tested the, the interaction between a heat pump. Um, and the energy system. So we basically used the, the grid emulator flaps um, to, to connect the heat pump. And then at the same time, we could um, see, the, see the interaction with the, between the hydraulic test bench and the um, simulated grid above here. Okay, just a few more pictures we see here of that, of that um, setup. Okay. Um, one other thing we do is um, we try to, to, to study the interaction between a communication system, ICT system, such as a mobile network and the power system. So what you can do is you can combine uh, um, simulators for uh, communication systems, um, such as um, OpNet or OmNet++, NS3. You can combine them with a um, with a power system simulator, and then um, yeah, introduce um, artificial delay, packet loss, and see how the, the protocols like IEC 61850 or PMUs behave if, if such um, network impairments are applied. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, on, on, on this slide here, we see uh, again the picture of the test bench, uh, which we um, use together with the Center for Wind Power Drives. That's a building just across uh, the campus here, where they, they built a large um, multi-physics uh, power hardware in the loop setup. And our task as ACS is just to, um, to provide the, the real-time simulation side for the grid. We still have... Um, uh, real-time simulators for the physical part of that setup, which is not handled by us. Um, so it's, a, it's, yeah, it's an effort, multiple uh, institutes, and I think we are trying for quite a long time to get this working, but it's actually a lot harder um, because here in that setup, we can see that we have a grid emulator, which is this, uh, are these converters here, which are connected to the electrical side of the nacelle of the turbine. And because of that, because that, that grid emulator is actually located a few kilometer, kilometers away, um, we need to find a very um, good interface between our grid simulation, which is located downstairs in the, in the basement, uh, and these uh, grid emulators. And that, that uh, shows to be uh, quite tricky, um, mainly because of the protocols, so that's, um, and also because these grid emulators are just over um, over specified um, converters, I think 20 megawatt in total, so three or four of them in parallel. But they are not power hardware in the loop amplifiers, as as I showed you before. So they are not um, linear amplifiers. At 25 megawatts uh, unimaginable, um, and therefore the the switching frequency is, is much slower and I think the, the control cycle of these grid emulators are in the range of a couple of hundred microseconds. Uh, we're talking about 500 to 700 microseconds um, cycle time for these controllers, um, yeah, which limits uh, the, the kind of uh, transients we could cause by these uh, grid emulators because the grid simulation itself runs with a time step of 50 microseconds, which is uh, yeah, much smaller. So that's still kind of a problem which we're trying to solve, but it takes some time. Here's a picture of that test bench. We can see on the left side the the west uh, the nacelle from uh, Vestas. Uh, here we see the a big uh, direct uh, drive um, DC motor, which is emulating the uh, physical um, torque on the shaft, and the blue thing in the middle here. I think that one as well. That's um, that's an, an actuator which allows us to to apply uh, torques not only in the radial direction but also like um, forces uh, sidewise onto the rotor. Okay. 
Okay. I think, okay, that slide I wanted to skip. I think that brings me to the end of, of my presentation. Um, here are the conclusion. Um, and 